This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, the story I now commence is rich in vicissitudes, grim with warfare, torn by civil strife, a tale of horror, even during times of peace. That's on page one of the histories by the Roman historian Tacitus. Tacitus Rome is a scene of crime, sex and violence, of excessive wealth and senatorial corruption. His work is a pungent study in tyranny and decline that has influenced depictions of Rome from Gibbon's decline and fall to Robert Graves' I, Claudius. But is it a true picture of the age? Does Tacitus' work present the tyranny and decadence of Rome at the expense of its virtues? And to what extent, when we look at the Roman Empire today, do we still see it through his eyes? With me to discuss Tacitus are Ellen Gorman, Senior Lecturer in Classics at the University of Bristol, Maria Wyke, Professor of Latin at University College London, and Catherine Edwards, Professor of Classics and Ancient History at Birkbeck University of London. Catherine Edwards, Tacitus' two major works are called Annals and the History, which cover most of the first century AD. Can you introduce us to the Annals, first of all? Right, well, Tacitus' Annals is actually his last work, but it covers the earliest period that he writes about, and that's the period from the death of Augustus in um, 14 AD down to, we think, the death of Nero, although the last parts of the Annals are actually missing. Um, So uh, also missing are the period that covers the reigns of Caligula and Claudius. Um, So so it's it's a fragmentary work, but it's nevertheless hugely important and has had the most massive influence on how we see ancient Rome. Can you tell us more what, how many books remain? For, uh, you've said that we don't know a bit about Caligula and so on. That's right. Well, we have um, books one to four, part of book five, um, book six, then um, books seven uh, to ten are missing, and then we have books 11 through to the fragmentary book 16. Book 16 breaks off in, at a very dramatic moment, and then we, we don't know what happens after that. So if you were to give an overall view of what you can get from what's remaining of the annals, what would you say that the theme was on the whole? Well, well, there are different ways in which one could see the theme. I mean, it's, it's the history of Rome, um, written in some ways in a traditional way, but preoccupied with the question, really, perhaps, of um, how one can go on being a, of a good Roman senator under the regime of the emperors. Is it actually possible to, to function as a Roman senator under that autocratic regime? Was he a man who would have first-hand knowledge of this? Absolutely. He was a Roman senator himself. He'd reached the, the highest peaks, really, of a Roman political career. He'd been a consul, which is Rome's highest magistracy, and he'd also had the very prestigious uh, post of proconsul of Asia, being the governor of Asia. So he knew history absolutely from the inside. And this other work of the histories, in what ways are different from the annals? The histories is written, in fact, earlier, but covering a later period. The period um, starts off um, covering uh, AD 69 for the period of the the year of the four emperors and um, goes through probably to the death of Domitian. Now, again, that work is also fragmentary. We only have the first part of it. But it's it's really concerned with civil war, primarily. And is that that different in the way it's written, the way it's... Aimed than than the than the annals. It's not profoundly different, and one might say that Tacitus's style is kind of more mature, perhaps, in the annals than it is in the histories. But the histories too is concerned with the sort of inner conflict of Rome, whether Rome can still be itself under the emperors, and in some ways, civil war, the 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 kind of um, conflict and violence of civil war that's that's um, uh, involves so many deaths uh, is is a sort of comes out as, as a kind of, in some ways, an essential characteristic of, of Rome, that Rome is, is a, uh, a nation that's always somehow been preoccupied with civil war. So by and large, these two, these two incomplete collections, the histories and the annals, are giving us a picture of Rome in the first century AD, of the Roman Empire in the first century AD, based on what is happening in Rome itself. Yes, it is largely based on Rome itself, but Tacitus also brings in what's happening on the edges of the Roman Empire, and in some ways that acts in counterpoint to events back in the city. So we get um, campaigns in Germany, campaigns in the east against the Parthians, campaigns in Britain. Can we develop that, uh, Eleanor Gorman? What is, is going, what is largely going on in the first century AD? 
Um, in terms of the, the history of the Yes, period. in terms of what's going on outside Rome, the, the battles, the, the extensions of empire, the defeats, some, some idea of what, mm. what, what is happening. Well, one of the things that, that Tacitus starts with at the beginning of the Annals is he says, um, in Augustus's will, one of the things that Augustus leaves to his successors is the advice that they don't extend the empire. Um, and so one of the themes of the Annals is, um, yes, we are, we are maintaining our boundaries, um, but we're not actually pushing our boundaries out any further. And this is then placing a constraint upon uh, the aristocratic class because it places a constraint on the kind of military glory that they can achieve um, by uh, con conquering new territories. Basically, they're in a maintenance pattern. And Tacitus says that about four books into the annals. He says, you must be aware that my history is different from earlier histories because there are no great wars. There are no cities to conquer. It'll be rather surprising to listeners, uh, it is to me, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm listening mm. to you obviously, that, uh, that Augustus puts this in his will mm. uh, and emperors follow it, uh, although emperors we think naturally want to mm. have more and more. Is this because they're obedient or because the emperor was big enough uh, for them to look after? Sometimes it's about practicality, but for each emperor it's a balancing task. Um, the Rhine frontier is one good example. It's, it's a natural frontier. So it's actually easy and, and therefore relatively inexpensive for the Romans to maintain. But any emperor who maintains uh, the boundaries also runs the risk of alienating, first of all, the people in Rome, because they like triumphs and, and money coming in, but also the legionaries out on the boundaries. And that becomes then the problem at the beginning of the histories, because the legionaries start naming their own emperors. So is this one of the big things that's happening? I know it's asking you to put a, a, a quote in a symbol, but is this the, one of the main things that's happening in the first century? In Rome, we're going to come to that, plenty of mm -hmm. and ac emperors and activities there, but out there, it's the, the Roman armies roving around and themselves gathering strength. Yes, well, they've always had strength. What they're lacking now is um, something focused to do, and that um, increases a sense of dishonour for them. But there's this, this rumour going around that we're not allowed to fight any wars anymore. Um, they also start to get attached to their military commanders, who of course are there and present, rather than to some figure back in Rome. Are we talking about an extremely rich empire in terms of material wealth? Is much booty and, uh, and goods coming in from, from the empire to Rome? Um, well, it's, it's no longer booty, because most of the time it's not about... Uh, looting. It's not about conquering new territories and looting. So it's more maintenance money. It's more about uh, local taxes um, and also, of course, the import, all-important grain coming particularly from Egypt. Um, so it's, it's a sort of regular maintained influx of money, which, of course, it is bringing with, us, uh, as, with it a system of collecting these taxes and siphoning them back to Rome. So outside Rome, are we talking about a largely settled uh, empire at this time? Um, Largely, it does vary from place to place. And, of course, at the, at the end of the histories as we have it, uh, the very brutal uh, Jewish war is, is being fought and the siege of Jerusalem is about to happen. Uh, Tustus also wrote about Germany and about Britain. What's mm. happening particularly there? Um, well, I think the reason he wrote about Germany, which was um, one of his earliest monographs, was probably because uh, he wrote this in AD 98, uh, the elderly new emperor Nerva had just adopted a young and experienced general Trajan as his successor, but Trajan was still out on the Rhine frontier and this was creating a certain amount of tension in Rome. Why was, why was our new emperor or new emperor to be still out uh, in Germany? And that was probably one of the reasons why Tacitus wrote a monograph on Germany, to explain the place to the Romans. Maria Wyke, he read about Britain as well in a biography of his father-in-law Agricola, yes, in it he, he, he declared, and so the population, the population of Britain, was gradually led into the demoralising temptations of arcades, baths and sumptuous banquets. The unsuspecting Britons spoke of such novelties as civilization, when in fact they were only a feature of their enslavement. Can you elaborate on that please? Yes, it, it's a curious thing about the Agricola that it's meant to be a eulogy of Tacitus's father-in-law. It is um, full of references to tribes who are subdued and kings who are captured and the establishment of forts and the final conquest from the Roman perspective of Britain. And yet it does take moments in which it chooses to critique empire and imperialism from the point of those who are conquered. So not only are we told that Agricola civilised the British and... Um, got them in, inured to warfare by 
offering them peace and leisure through things like the building of cities and temples. Um, he got the um, chieftain's sons to be educated. The the British the Britons became very interested in learning the Latin language and putting on the toga. And yet Tacitus then says precisely that this was not a process of civilization, but a process of entering into servitude, because these features also led to the demoralizing lifestyle that comes with arcades and baths and um, banquets. And he also allows some of the uh, conquered to criticize the imperial process in the most extraordinary moving fashion. So famously, there's a celebrated speech by the Caledonian chieftain, Calgacus, as he summons 30,000 troops in the northernmost part of Scotland to fight a last stand <coughs> against the Romans. And he describes himself as the last of the free and the Romans as pillagers of the world. And then he, um, he says to his troops that what the Romans have called imperium, what they call government, has been nothing but looting, um, ravaging and butchery, and that what they call peace has actually been desolation. And over the centuries, that moving speech about um, the, the problems of imperialism have been take, taken up time and time again, and, and what rings through the the years is the speech of Calgacus, even though it's embedded in a story that praises the triumphs of Agricola. It is curious, isn't it, because he, he, he very much admires the, the, the Britons, especially the North Britons, the Caledonians, let's say, picked Caledonians, let, let's just say North. Uh, <laughs> nor, Northern Britain, we're sick for Northern Britain. Uh, and yet he, at the end he's quite pleased the Romans <laughs> beat them, of course. But he finds great virtues in them. And the virtues he finds uh, to, to switch to civilization might be called Spartan virtues. And actually being introduced to civilization, and the Brits, you think, well, it might be quite civilized to go to a banquet or the theatres. He calls this enslavement. And this runs through his later works, The History of the Annals, as, a, as, as themes very strongly, doesn't it? Can you develop that? Yes, I mean, in a sense, what's really striking about that particular comment in the Agricola is that Tacitus is suggesting that, that decadence is a gift, a gift that Romans give to the people that they colonise. And, and one way a of... A poison chalice, though. Yes, in, indeed mm. it is. And one way of understanding that is that, in some senses, it actually constitutes a, a critique of Rome itself. And, and to go back to, to what Catherine Ellen have been, have been saying about how all the writings of Tacitus are in some sense about the subjection of the Roman world to emperors, you can see that in, in talking about the Romans subjecting the Britons, in talking about living in arcades and having banquets as a demoralizing process, as a move from liberty to servitude, is a kind of progression which the Romans themselves have already experienced. And the only peoples, Tacitus is suggesting, who now have the traditional values that Romans used to have, live on the margins of the empire. So it's not necessarily even Spartan virtues. To some degree, some of these um, Caledonian tribes exhibit old Roman virtues, which is excellence in warfare, uh, a dedication to the freedom of your people, loyalty to your families, respect for your ancestors, duty to your descendants. These are all things that the Romans valued immensely highly. And Tacitus is saying, where is that now? It's not at the centre anymore. And he uses them as the yardstick, rather, rather than looking back uh, to Augustus or before, before Augustus. Yes, he, he does to a degree because... I mean, you could say that there's always a sense in his narratives, of, as there are in many of the imperial histories, that there was this earlier fantastic golden age of the Republic and a decline into imperial times. But actually, interestingly, Tacitus suggests that the time of political equality, the time of true Republican government, the time of traditional Roman mor morals was actually in the very, very, very dim, distant past. And we're not talking about a hundred years ago. We're not talking about Augustus. We're not even talking about before Augustus. We're talking about um, the second century BC. And he suggests that, that what has happened, the problem is that there may well have been this period, and one starts to think that perhaps he thinks it never quite was ever as good as that. Um, he suggests that the problem is it's in the nature of man to seek power. And 
the the dangers for Rome is when that power is worldwide, is global. So there's a sequence of events. Uh, man desires power. Power brings uh, wealth. Wealth brings civil war. Civil war brings autocracy. And there we are in this uh, decadent age. So he kind of suggests that, that it's almost always been like that. Well, let's turn to the decadence of Rome, Catherine Edwards. Can we look more specifically at his idea of decadence? What did he see as the nature of corruption? What did Tacitus see? What, what was it that was corrupt and, uh, uh, and, and decadent in, in, in the Rome of, let's say, the first century AD, the Rome of the early emperors? Well, I think it's, it's very interesting. It's a very complex process in Tacitus. I mean, there is this, this issue, as Maria very rightly says, of, of autocracy as being something that, in a sense, Rome is always heading towards, and, and you get the, these kind of almost cycles, as he talks about the Republic, that Rome starts off as a city ruled by kings, but then you get liberty in the consulship, but then some, somehow periods of, of one-man rule become increasingly frequent until we get to the, the sort of system set up by Augustus. So that there's a sense in which um, individual rulers are to blame, the system's to blame, but also that the Roman Senate are to blame as well, because um, they, they collude, they collude with emperors, they see that as the only way that they can um, do well for themselves, is by collusion. So, so what's quite curious about the way Augustus the way Tacitus talks about the, the um, system of the Principate is that it's not simply a question of blaming the emperors, but that it's everybody is somehow compromised by it. Including Alan Agon and Tacitus himself. I mean, he paints a picture of the Roman Senate uh, in relation to the empress. He says uh, in Agricola, we, the senators, must include him, led the emperor's opponents to prison. We watched their sufferings in shame. We stayed, stained ourselves with their innocent mm. blood. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, he's talking about the guilt of the senatorial order as a whole, and one of the things he starts to explore in the Agricola and explores in very detailed ways throughout the annals and histories is um, what you do as an individual senator in Senate. And there's, there's, there's a number of things you can do. One is you can, as Catherine says, collude. And the most uh, striking examples of those and the most horrifying examples are um, you start to bring accusations of treason against your fellow senators. Um, people that you know the emperor is suspicious of, you collude by dragging these people to destruction actively. You actually take, you yourself, as senators, take them to the prison. You, you, you we watch their sufferings them. in shame. Mm. That means you watch them being tortured. Yes, I, I mean, the example he's giving of um, we ourselves hauled, I think it's Helvidius Priscus, off to prison. Um, we have another source saying one senator did actually lay hands on Helvidius in Senate and drag him physically to prison. Um, and the rest of the Senate, of course, stood there and were horrified or not, as the case may be. And, and so he said, we are guilty by association. So that's the other thing you can do. You can actively take on accusations, and you can benefit from that. Um, you can stand to one side and not take on accusations and be silent, or you can actively speak up and dissent, but you run the risk then of yourself being brought to trial for treason. So the fish is rotting from the head. It, it, the corruption for him begins in the Senate and the corruption of the Senate. Mm -hmm. Maria, can I just, Mary, can I just go back one moment to the the idealised past? You put it to say three centuries before Tacitus was writing. But was there not a sense because we're, we're brought up to think the Republic not very long ago, uh, about just about the time of. Uh, just before the death of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, that was thought of as when Rome was great, when people were elected and uh, for a short time and the feeling of, of, of a sort of male, upper-class democracy, uh, but, but, but there it was. That didn't enter into his, uh, his, his thought very strongly at all. Well, he, he perceives the period before Augustus as one that has already... Um, Augustus, his, his peers' dates were... Well, Augustus of officially comes to power the day that Cleopatra flees the, the Battle of Actium in 31 mm. BC, and um, shortly after, she and Mark Antony commit suicide. And at that point, Augustus is, is seen as what's called the, the princeps, the pr principate starts, which means, in theory, the, the most excellent among many, but is clearly heading gradually towards what we now call um, the, the, the reigns of the emperors, the house of the Caesars in Rome. So 
Tacitus doesn't necessarily suggest that the, the, the division is at the moment when um, we have what we now call our first Emperor Augustus. He suggests that, that it's all started long before that with all the civil wars and the um, legionaries who are devoted to their generals is an issue that has occurred already before the time of Augustus with, for example, the battles between Julius Caesar and Pompey. Pompey yeah. Yeah. But, but what, what Tacitus does do also that's quite interesting is he, he kind of idolises the Republican historians in the, in the sense that he, he, at least he says that in the time before Tiberius, who comes to power after Augustus, in, in the time before Tiberius, historians wrote about the people of Rome, not the one ruler of Rome. When they wrote about the people of Rome, they wrote with uh, a lack of partisanship, a lack of anger about great events. But once you have a single ruler then history is um, either completely servile or completely hostile. And he suggests that what he's, he's now trying to, in a way, return to the neutrality of Republican histories and do the difficult task of writing about emperors while um, sine ira et studio, I think he says, without anger or partisanship. Catherine Edwards, the sexual uh, activities, mores, were seen, uh, very important in Tacitus. Does he link? Is, does he make a direct, a direct link between moral and political corruption? He does. He does, and he does this in various different ways. I mean, with the Emperor Tiberius, who's the first emperor that we we hear about in detail, um, we get the the. Um, the kind of lusts of Tiberius, which are not talked about in a, in a great deal of detail, and there's a contrast there with Suetonius's biography of Tiberius, which goes into all kinds of sordid detail. Um, but Tacitus is in some ways more high-minded, but nevertheless, the, the kind of the lusts of Tiberius are a, a key part of his characterization, and we can see that as, as kind of a, a reflection of, of the kind of traditional picture of what a tyrant is like. A tyrant is somebody whose lusts are, are unbridled, and whose perverse lusts are unbridled, and so this is part of the way in which we can perceive the tyranny of Tiberius. If we look on to um, later emperors, Claudius... We're not doing it to scandal sheets. It's just if you can give us some idea of the loss of Tiberius. <laughs> so that, well, mm, OK. Well, we yes. are all prepared to cover our ears, but we said of some indication because the lusts have changed their nature as the times go on. Well, yes. I mean, he... What, a lot of it is done by kind of innuendo, and there's... Um, Tiberius... Is, has spent a long period of time uh, on roads before he becomes emperor, and kind of quite what he was doing there remains a the subject of rumour and gossip. And rumour and gossip is hugely important in Tacitus, and that's one of the ways in which knowledge circulates, but it's never, it's never entirely clear how stable that knowledge is un under the Principate. And sometimes he'll tell a dreadful story and say, oh, actually, this isn't, you know, there's no real grounds for thinking this is true, but it's important because people were telling the story, and that's part of how they perceived what was going on. So still no information about lust. <laughs> Never mind. It it's, 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 um, I'm afraid it's really quite uh, improper for, um, for the radio at this I'll time of day. I'll take your word for it. Um, the, but what connection did you see? Well, that I think um, it, it's, a, it's a symptom of um, uh, a political regime that is not... Um, as it should be when the ruler is indulging his lusts. And um, with, with Nero, we see that manifested in a rather different way, um, more, perhaps more flagrant way. Um, Nero uh, has, uh, indulges his, his um, lusts with, with a slave girl, Acte. That's not so bad in the great scheme of things, but by far the kind of, or, or one of the worst aspects of Nero's reign is his relationship with his mother, Agrippina. Um, does he or doesn't he have incestuous relations with Agrippina? This is a kind of key question and in some ways it's this which, is, which prompts um, Nero's uh, murder of his mother, something we might come on to later. Um, but there are other stories about Nero uh, and his, his lust. He's alleged to have had a sort of a public exhibition of a marriage ceremony with a, a, a man, Pythagoras, um, who, uh, at which Nero played the bride and allegedly acted out all the things that would have happened in private for a normal um, wedding happen in public um, for Nero's uh, wedding to Pythagoras. Well, I think I see what you mean. I think <laughs> we shall draw a veil over that particular wedding. Um, women uh, seem to be characterised, Maria Wake, as... Um, scheming, sexually voracious and generally responsible for bringing down weak and otherwise virtuous men. Is this what you find in Tacitus? 
Well, he has a gr- many very interesting tales to tell about um, women and in particular about uh, Messalina and Agrippina. If we just take Messalina as an example, since I can see that you want the wife no, of Claudius, since I can see you want some specific uh, no, I just details would like here, to, this is all I, okay. Look, I, when I did the trial for this programme, <laughs> I said, section, uh, at the top of the programme, there's actually, and there is a Trials Description Act operating on in our right. time, you know. Well, in the I case did, of Tiberius, you've you'll said quite it. enough people, <laughs> you say what you want to say, but it's part of it, and it, I'm getting most of it from the notes of you three, so you can <laughs> raise your eyebrows as much as you want. What's on paper can be on air. <laughs> right, let's talk about Messalina, Claudius. Well, the interesting story that Tacitus tells about Messalina is that he indicates that she was uh, an extremely just, lustful, uh, utterly promiscuous young bride of this aged, rather decrepit, imbecilic Emperor Claudius. Um, and that in her perversities, in her sexual perversities, she chose to pursue um, the idea of marrying her lover, which might not sound particularly perverse, but it is when you're already married to the emperor of Rome. And so she decides to go through an entire um, wedding ceremony with her lover in Rome openly, including the wedding veil, the banquet, the the marriage bed, um, Claudius's freedmen are absolutely horrified by by this activity. They want to try and get rid of her, and so they um, they have to think through how to do this without Claudius actually seeing her um, falling on his mercy. So we we're told this fantastic tale that they send a couple of Claudius's mistresses out to him um, because he's out in Ostia at the time um, to tell him what has happened. He comes racing back to Rome. Um, Messalina's banquet immediately um, dissol- dissolves. She goes running through the city and can only find a garden refuse cart to get to him because Tacitus likes these little little details. Um, when she finally reaches Claudius, the, the freedmen start shouting over her when she's pleading for mercy and they put lists of her lovers in front of Claudius's eyes so he can't be reminded how beautiful she is. They, they take him back into the city, show him the lover's house where half his property now resides, so he's suitably shocked and goes off for a good dinner, at which point he decides that perhaps he will see her the next day. So the freedmen then have to slaughter her that night to make sure there's no possibility of that, and when they finally tell Claudius what's happened, he just asks for another bottle of wine, and then a, a while later marries somebody else. And if we ask, well, what is that story doing in Tacitus, what does it tell us about um, the roles of women? You could say that it's, uh, it's a perfect example of senatorial government gone horribly wrong because all that's happening here is a contest for power between the wife of the emperor and his freed men. And Claudius is just this idiotic old man deluded by everybody around him. But Eleanor, Eleanor Gorman, I'm sorry, you wanted to say something. I want to no. ask you a question. You, you said you wanted <laughs> well, to Well, I, I, I suppose I wanted to take up um, our reluctance to talk about the sex scenes. There yeah. are very few sex scenes in Tacitus, and if we read it, Tacitus only for the sex scenes, we're missing the point. Um, what Maria says is absolutely right. It's, it's a sign of the corruption of senatorial power, but it's also Tacitus tells very few of these sex scenes because they show no possibility of redemption. Um, he's more interested in senatorial scenes because there is the possibility of redemption there. But one of the reasons of dwelling on women is that in, if you have a, a hereditary system, uh, emperors with the, mm. the, the, the Caesars of the emperors, then the woman's very important because she bears the heir, mm. and therefore she will have control, far more control of the heir as, mm. if, as a mother than anybody else. So she mm. becomes extremely important in that particular small scheme of things. Yes. Mind you, aristocratic women, even in the, the late Republic, um, had a, a degree of political clout, and there used to be, um, you know, that the aristocratic women of, of Rome had a sort of club uh, that got together and, and they networked and uh, sorted out whose daughters were going to marry whose sons, which was, you know, a sort of keystone of, of political alliances in Republican Rome. So in one way, what we see is, is that political influence of the Republican woman uh, expanded beyond its normal... Um, be not beyond its normal influence to an excessive degree, and there it is a symptom of the same thing happening with the husband, that instead of having lots of senators, you have the emperor um, Ca- expanded beyond Sorry. his normal status. Catherine. Well, I think that's absolutely right, but I think it's very, very interesting the way that Tastus homes in on particularly Livia, who's the wife of Augustus and the mother of Tiberius, and Agrippina, who's the wife of Claudius and mother of Nero, and is indeed Livia's great-granddaughter, and Tastus actually plays on the resemblance between the two of them. They are some of the most compelling figures in the annals. Um, L- Livia, the 
the alleged poisoner um, who plays a key role in getting her son uh, onto the, the, the imperial throne, given that actually Tiberius is not the son of Augustus, and then Agrippina, who does the, exactly the same thing for her son Nero, who is not the son of Claudius, and manages to sort of sideline Claudius's own son in doing that. Um, but also with Agrippina, we see an attempt to sort of muscle in on, or what Tastus presents as muscling in on, the great decisions of, of state. So um, t- t- Agrippina wants to be there welcoming the ambassadors. Agrippina wants to be sort of part of, she wants to have a sort of, you know, a, a little hidey hole made where she can listen in on um, senatorial debate and so on and um, in some ways the, the very fact that any woman can be in that position is in itself the, the most egregious symptom of um, how corrupt, how wrong the system of the principate is for Tacitus because traditionally women are not to have any, there should be a strict divide and what happens in the, within the household is one thing in terms of marriage alliances and so on but what happens in the senate, that sh- senate should be where the decisions are made not the emperor's bedroom has, has it, would it be true to say that Tacitus hasn't many good words to say for many people, Eleanor Gorman? Uh, uh, one of the people he does respect is a, an historian, Cremutius Cordus. Do most, most people come up badly in his, uh, in his um, annals and histories? Most of the problem people come up badly. Um, it's that interesting is to say to badly they fall from high standards one way or another. Corruption. They fall from high standards one way or the other. He's, he's, he's sometimes a little bit more complex than that. I mean, sometimes he has characters who you think are going to be... Uh, uniformly dreadful. Uh, one example is Lucius Vitellius, the father of the Emperor Vitellius. The other is the Emperor Otho. Um, in both instances, these are people who lead very dissolute lives in the city, are given a provincial command, hey presto, go out to the provinces, and and behave impeccably. Um, so he's, he is aware that people don't always behave as you expect. Certainly any historian he mentions, uh, Cremutius Cordus gets a huge seen um, in book four of the annals because he's just written a history, he's called the assassins of Caesar the last of the Romans and he's now arraigned for treason and he gives uh, a great speech defending uh, history and defending his memory and then goes out and commits suicide. But also incidentally um, there's, there's a, an obituary of uh, Servilius Nonianus and he says you know, this man led an excellent life um, and, and all he says is this man wrote Roman history, he led an excellent life he doesn't appear anywhere else um, so I think he, he continues to feel, picking up on what Maria said about history in the past, that if you, if you decide you're going to be a Roman historian, you're already somewhere on the path of virtue. Maria, to, to take that word history, is it history as you three would understand it, or is it, uh, is it what might be called the higher gossip, or would you, would you sort of let it pass as history today? I, I source is clear, uh, does he, that, that sort of thing, checking well, things out? <coughs> In some senses, it's it's much less. Uh, it would fail by the standards of, say, um, you know, serious historical scholarship in terms of its um, lack of explicitness about its documentation and in the style that it's written and in all sorts of other respects. But in some senses, it's so much more than any modern history could be because it has so many higher expectations of what history ought to be doing. And it's pragmatic in the sense that Tacitus says the work of history is to commemorate um, great deeds and to bring to the attention of posterity evil deeds to um, denounce them. Um, he also treats history as, as didactic. It, it will, we, we should learn from history. We should be able to predict the future from what we see in the past and he is writing as a statesman for readers who are going to have a life in public office. So it's and moral instruction as well? Everybody. Well it's ethical as well because mm. we should learn good and bad behaviour from within the writings and because it has a strong sense of its utility history has an, uh, an incredibly important function to play in society because of that you have to stir up the emotions of your audience you have to engage them and to engage them you write in a style that is full of rhetorical ornamentation devices that we would nowadays call novelistic uh, dramas um, direct speeches all that sort of thing is meant to move your audience so your audience will then learn and will take from the past what's needed for the future. Catherine, can I ask, turn to the question of, uh, of Tacitus' influence. What Do we know the influence he had around his own time, before we move on from there? 
Well, we don't actually have a lot of history writing in Latin from after Tacitus, um, and we don't even know what happened to Tacitus in the end. Um, people argue about the degree to which he may have been a, an important influence on the historian of the sort of later centuries of the Roman Empire, Ammianus Marcellinus. Um, later on, uh, if we're looking, you know, far into the future, he he does um, he's sort of rediscovered in the Renaissance, and uh, we find scholars like uh, Sir Thomas More is very very interested in Tacitus, and that one can detect a certain kind of tacity and tone to the way he talks about um, British monarchs like Richard II, um, and then perhaps one could go through to, to Gibbon and Tacitus. Well, let's go through to Gibbon, Eleanor Gorman. He, did he have a, Gibbon's a History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in the 18th century, a very important work in, 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 in British history? Uh, what is the influence on, on, on Gibbon direct and uh, very uh, important? It's direct and acknowledged. Um, there's, there's, of course, the, the famous paragraph in, in Gibbon where he recounts uh, the scene of, of the Augustan Restoration in the Senate and says it would take the pen of a Tacitus to describe this, um, not only describe what the people are saying, but their inner motivations as well. Um, that uh, what he's very interested in, first of all, is, is the way that Tacitus's rhetoric of appearance versus reality um, pervades his historical vision. So Tacitus and Gibbon. Uh, are always saying, uh, this person did this um, apparently from the motive of X, but actually from the motive of Y, though people also said motive W, choose what you will. Um, I think Gibbon is also interested in Tacitus because Tacitus's uh, narrative of what is happening is also continually informed by the potentiality of, of the actions he describes. Um, for the for the present for the present readership in particular in the way that Maria has outlined, but also for that overall generalized sense of what what is power and how does it affect individual rulers and people living under rulers. But Gibbon goes straight for it, and his title says "The Decline and Fall mm. of the Roman Empire." And is the idea of the decline and fall of the empire does, is that coming from? Did, Tacitus set the idea of how you wrote about Rome. You wrote about the decline and fall of Rome rather than the rise and, uh, uh, and grandeur of Rome. Well, decline is a theme that occurs throughout Roman literature, even, even before the time of the emperors. Rome is in decline as far as its writers are concerned. They're always in decline because the golden age is always somewhere far in the distance. So even Horace writing under Augustus talks about Rome having already declined from its Republican <coughs> days. So it's a, it's a kind of trope, but it's one that becomes especially important under the emperors and especially important once you've experienced the reign of terror of an emperor like Domitian. So then there's a much progressively stronger sense and perhaps more of a reason to, to think that Rome is somehow in decline. In what way was Domitian's a, a reign of terror than in Tacitus? Uh, do we know that, uh, Catherine? Well, Domitian um, is described in most detail in Tacitus' biography of his father-in-law, Agricola, mm. and um, there are references to individual senators who come to a, to a bad end under Domitian. One of the things that's quite interesting is that Tacitus writes as though the reign of Domitian were far worse than anything that had preceded it, and yet in terms of the sort of number of fatalities, it seems to be considerably fewer. I think so Tacitus is often in the business of presenting an impression that he doesn't, isn't quite substantiated by the factual details that he chooses to include. But certainly Domitian, uh, you know, we, we also get other Roman writers who present us with a very positive picture of Domitian, although those tend to be less believed than Tacitus. But it might be in a sense that, that Tacitus writes like that about Domitian because that is, that is the tyranny that he personally experienced. And he says um, quite movingly at one point in the Agricola that, that now that Domitian is dead, he says that after 15 years of, of a tyranny of that nature, um, we can never be what we once were, that there's no possibility even of returning to the partial freedoms um, the partial liberty that Romans had 15 years earlier, let alone going back to the Republic. Except Alan? what he says at that moment is, now we can speak, all right, our, our voices are rough, our voices are not practised, but now we can at least speak. And what we would love to have, of course, is, is the rest of the histories, because the rest of the histories, if it, if it was extant, would give us Tacitus's contemporary history, and, and that would be very interesting. Mm. One of the interesting aspects of, of Tacitus, though, is that although at one point he promises that he will talk about his own times in more detail and says you know, these are the times when you can you know, say what you think and you have freedom, he never actually kind of really writes about those good times, and one might see that as partly because it's not ultimately congenial to his particular style of writing to, to, to celebrate the good. 
Many people listening to this program will have, have received, as it were, Tacitus' view of history through Robert Graves, through I, Claudius, Claudius, the God, either on the, pa- on, on the screen or off the page. Uh, how far did, uh, how many liberties did Graves take with Tacitus? Well, no. well, in some senses, he's extremely Tacitian in that the hero of his work is a historian, because if you remember in, in I, Claudius, and Claudius, the God, the Claudius is represented as someone who's writing a history of Rome for posterity. He's writing a history in which he wants to expose the corruption of the imperial house in the hope that there can be a, re- a return to the days of republican traditions. I mean, that's, in a sense, rather similar to the point of Tacitus, but he's also extremely untacitian in that he draws on many other ancient authors and brings in uh, many of the anecdotes that, that Catherine was mentioning earlier on. And perhaps one of our strongest memories of, of those um, novels and of the BBC series in the 70s were, were the sex scenes that, um, that, that now are given a great deal of prominence as a way of demonstrating the corruption of empire. But Catherine, what, what he's doing, it seems to me, uh, Graves, when Tacitus suggests things and says, but these are rumours, but rumours are important because you have to know the gossip of the day, that's part of the context of the day, Graves just piles in and said, look, Messalina did this, and here we, are, here we go. I think that's absolutely right, yes. The sort of, you know, rumours about did Livia poison Augustus's grandsons or not? Did she actually poison Augustus? All that then becomes actualised in, in the Robert Graves version. But, of course, with television you can't it's much more difficult to present you know different possible interpretations you you have to choose which to go for we're talking about the books it does the same well, in the book yes i can't blame television it's blame great i mean it makes great books <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's a different true. matter <laughs> One of the interesting Tacitian influences on Graves is, is the scene when the young Claudius, who is training to be a historian, goes to um, the library of Augustus on the Palatine, and he meets the two great historians of the time, Livy, who we have, and Asinius Pollo, Pollio, who we don't have. And they write very different sorts of histories, we know that. Um, and, and the young Claudius has to choose which historian he will follow. He decides to follow Asinius Pollio. And Sinius Pollio is um, the, the stylist whom Tacitus is ultimately following. So there's, there's a sort of occluded Tacitianism there. Finally, Catherine, how, how, how much do you trust uh, Tacitus' view of Rome? Well, I think Tacitus' view of Rome is an incredibly powerful view because he does present us with this very sophisticated and ironical view of human motivation, which I think is, many, many readers have found deeply compelling. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine Edwards, Eleanor Gorman and Maria White. This is the last in this series, uh, this series of In Our Time. We'll be back at the end of September. And the programmes from this series and many more are on the website. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>